Welcome to the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. I'm your host, Maritza Barone. In this show, I will introduce you to ideas, concepts, and mindsets that will open your mind to a new world of well-being and personal life growth. Through eye-opening interviews, we elevate people in the world doing amazing things for humanity and share insights that will shift you to become the happiest, healthiest, kindest, and most compassionate version of you. Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Things You Can't Unhear. So after two months off between season two and season three of this podcast, a lot has happened in my world. And for those who missed last week's episode, I interviewed Charlie, my partner, and we shared the fact that we have decided to follow a long-term goal of ours and relocate to Fiji for a while. Been here now for about four or five weeks, two of which were in hotel quarantine where we had our fair share of COVID tests, where we were starting to get used to having sticks put up our noses. Uh, Thankfully, that part of the journey is over. Um, And here we are living in Fiji. Now, why Fiji? So for us, Fiji has always been a great place to visit and we've enjoyed coming here over 10 to 12 times as a family over the years. And and I've been here as a kid myself with my my family. Uh, We love the culture, the people, the slower paced, simpler lifestyle. Uh, We have friends who live here and that's um, always drawn us back here as well. When COVID hit, it really forced us to look at what was important in our life and to go after our dreams. Eight months of hard Melbourne lockdown does it to a person. It makes you start to question things more deeply and, I don't know, prioritise happiness. So here we are. The kids have changed schools and are wearing the cutest buller shirts I have ever seen as their school uniforms. The school is incredibly multicultural and have been making friends and even volunteering at an animal shelter here in their spare time. It is island life and it's very different to what we're used to back at home in Melbourne, Australia, but it's definitely an adventure. It's definitely new to us living on an island this small and so far we're, we're really happy. So while I'm here in Fiji, I want to make a conscious effort to share stories of people who have lived here or grown up here or any interesting people I meet along the way to share a deeper side of Fiji and what is at the heart and the core of the people, including their triumphs and their struggles. So just before I left Australia, I started working with a couple of new clients, Sardna Smiles and Div Pillay, to produce their podcast called Business in Colour. And when I told them I was moving to Fiji, they they were in shock. Number one, because they were wondering what on earth we were going to do here. But number two, because this is where Sadna was actually from. So welcome, Sadna, to the show. I thought it was a no-brainer to have you here to talk to me today. Oh, thank you, Maritza. I can't believe you're in Fiji and I'm not. You have no idea the levels of my jealousy right now. (laughs) What was your first reaction truly when you heard I was coming here? WTF. (laughs) I'm sorry, probably not like to swear on these things, but I was like, what the? How does she get to go and I don't? There's something wrong here. But anyway, I'm very pleased you're there and it's just a lovely place to be in at the moment, better than... Melbourne so. right now yeah so how long has it been since you've been here oh I was there um so I was there last year in November and then um of course you know I went um away for Christmas came back to Melbourne and then basically we went into lockdown I mean yep. normally I come back home two or three times a year um so I've got a lot of time to make up oh well so for everyone who hasn't heard of Sadna before she is now based in Australia she's the CEO of real estate industry partners REIP and the former CEO of Harcourt's property management and Harcourt's Victoria this year she's launched two podcasts that I know about the first as I mentioned is called business in color which talks to diversity and social inclusion in the workplace and That's alongside her powerhouse co-host, Div Pillay. And she's also just launched another podcast called Market Insights with Tim Lawless. And Sadna, you're a true woman of power, I must say. I'm so inspired by a lot of your story and a lot of your work. 
Oh, thank you. That's very nice of you to say that. Um, no problem. I mean, we're going to share a lot of that today in this conversation, but I really want to start about what it was like to grow up in Fiji for you. Well, I'm, I'm probably going to start off with, you know, I, whenever I, I speak publicly, I talk about sharing my backstory because I'm a big believer that quite often the backstory forms a lot of who we end up being when we get older. And so, you know, my mum and dad were from two different sides of the island as such. So my dad, my mum's family came from India. They were, you know, brought over as slaves. So my great grandfather and my grandfather, their family were all brought out of India into Fiji to work in the sugarcane fields. And a number of uh, people in Fiji have that heritage. A lot of number of Indians in Fiji have that heritage. And a few years ago now I did all the research and got all the paperwork together and, you know, found the boat he came on, where he went, where he lived. Um, the stories about what it was like in those days, um, you know, working in the cane fields and stuff. And, and it, it's pretty incredible story and history that we all have from that side of the family. Um, you know, my grandfather then uh, and his family decided to stay in Fiji and they had um, a farm, a sugarcane farm. Um, you know, he grew rice, he had rice mill, he had a, a milk bar, you know, they owned land, uh, he drove buses. And so he was, you know, what we would call in today's climate, business climate, an entrepreneur. Um, and, and, you know, for, for a man who probably grew up in, in quite brutal conditions at, at that time, he was a very kind and humble man. My grandmother was the opposite. She was four foot nothing, tattooed. She smoked. She had a, a wicked sense of humour and she had a great sense of right and wrong. And if you got in her way, man, did you know about it? <laughs> um, and I reflect on, you know, reflect on them as humans. And I think, you know, my grandmother's audacity and my grandfather's determination genetically runs through us today in, in all of our family. And then my dad's side um, came to Fiji as traders. So they, you know, came as business people and they had shops and, and business. And my mum and dad, um, and this is the interesting thing, right, and, and because the culture plays a big part in, in who we are. My grandfather, the fact that he was never educated, he was a farmer, you know, he, he sent all of his daughters to get educated every one of them, and three of them were sent overseas. Now, that is remarkable for a man of his time. Mm. And my mother was one of those women. She was sent to Brisbane where she met my dad. And they have a beautiful love story where, um, you know, my dad met her at an event and he instantly fell in love with her and was like, she's the woman I'm going to marry. And he literally went door knocking around Brisbane. He kind of knew where she lived and he literally went door knocking around Brisbane to find where she was. And, you know, when she opened the door, he was like, you know, I'm Jerry and I'd love to, you know, get to know you, etc. And so they, they went out for eight years and um, then decided to get married. But the problem was that my father's family who were Gujaratis and my mother was a North Indian family. They didn't accept the fact that my father wanted to marry this woman who was not part of their caste or their culture. And so they they created a lot of problems for my parents. And, you know, if you read the letters that they wrote to each other during that time, which we have, there was so much angst between them caused by family. My mother's side were fine, but caused by my father's side because they were in love and they wanted to get married. And kudos to my mum and dad, despite all of the everything that was thrown at them, they managed to elope to New Zealand and get married in a Presbyterian church. And, you know, mm. that is just such a beautiful love story. And it was a successful marriage by the sounds of it. It was. It was then they married for, well, they knew each other for 63 years. Um, and, uh, you know, they wanted to live in Australia. They didn't want to go back home. They wanted to live in Australia. But the white Australia policy was around in Australia in the 60s. And so they got caught up in that. And dad's visa was rejected. And so they had to, they had to go back home. And, and, you know, in hindsight, it's such a shame that they had to go back home because going home meant that, you know, my father's family didn't accept my mum. And as a consequence, I didn't accept her children. And so I actually grew up. Um, in an environment that was hugely discriminating. Um, they didn't accept anything to do with my side of the family. Um, and so I think discrimi you... the discrimination was coming from your family. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because we were, you know, my mother was different. She was a strong Indian woman and not the same caste. And I think when you're little, when you're young, and you have one half of your family not accept you, 
because of your mother, it actually, um, it impacts you very deeply. And it impacted me very deeply. You know, I, I watched my mother cry. I watched my mother be humiliated. I watched my mother not be accepted into festivals, birth, deaths and marriages. And then, you know, the same happened to me. Um, and so I think I, I grew up very angry. I grew up um, very resilient. Um, and I grew up with a great sense of right and wrong, knowing that that behaviour is not acceptable, that culture is not acceptable. It is not right to um, disown part of your family purely because they're from a different caste. And so I have questioned so many things about my culture, my religion, how it impacts women, um, the decisions we make in the family. And I think at the end of the day, and, and I say this to women in Australia as well, you know, I work with a lot of migrant women and I throw this out to them and I say, we almost, you know, we have our battles to fight in our culture at home. And then we have our battles to fight in the workplace, in business. The problem is that if we accept and let our culture do what it asks, asks us to do at home, how can we then have the same battles in the workplace? So we have to, as women from culturally diverse backgrounds, we have to win our battles at home first. And that yeah. means standing up to a lot of the norms and cultures that we've grown up with and challenging them and saying that they're not acceptable. Because if you can't have it at home, you're going to find it really hard to have it in the workplace. Mm. You, you seem to have spent a lot of your life um, standing up to those experiences in, in the work that you've been doing along the way. And, and even in this podcast that you've recently produced called Business in Colour, obviously that's stemming from all of these wounds and, and experiences that you've had leading up to that moment. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, I've my father sadly passed away recently, um, four mm. weeks today, actually, the, the 4th of, of, of um, November, he died so very, very suddenly. Um, and I think his passing made me really reflect on a number of things. And, and you know, it, it's interesting because um, the, the religion that we have, that we follow, and all of the ceremonies that we did because we wanted to honour my dad, just even in that process as his daughter, and my father never distinguished me and my brother. You know, he was never like, you're the daughter, therefore you don't have as many rights as my son does. He treated us equally. You know, he... He called my brother boy and I can show you text messages going back to 2012 where it was, hey, boy, to me as well. Mm -hmm. He never distinguished us. He believed in education. He sent me to Australia for an education. So he was a man. And even the work that he did around his charity in Fiji, he made sure that he educated a significant number of young women so they would have doors and opportunities open up to them. So he was a man who um, was, you know, again, very modern and very open to women having careers and, and, and good lives. And yet when he passed, I was stopped from doing simple things like carrying his coffin. Why couldn't I carry his coffin? This is a man who carried me on his shoulders for many, 54 years. Yet I couldn't do the same thing for him. I couldn't do final prayers for him because I was the daughter. And so there are significant things that we have in our culture that stop us from having equal rights in a family, regardless of how the family works. And then we get the bullshit thrown at us. Well, you know, if we don't do this, then there's going to be bad luck. And if we don't do this, then his soul isn't going to be at peace. Now, this is my challenge to people who are listening to stuff to this today. If somebody has spent 82 years of their life doing good and being good, and when they are gone, if I choose to do things slightly differently, how can you believe in a God that's going to punish you? How can you believe in a culture that's going to say you are wrong when that human did so much good for 82 years? And that's what I can't get my head around. And that is why this is, you know, I, I say this to women, we have to win these battles at home um, because if we don't win these battles at home, we will never win these battles in the workplace. Listening to you, my heart is beating. I have goosebumps. I'm feeling really teary and emotional, and I know you are too. I can see that. You're doing such incredible work to, to voice that passion of yours and to voice that important message that is needed 
and and I feel like you know it's working you just have to keep going and, and I'm so sorry for your loss of your dad he sounded like a, a magnificent person and and obviously taught you a lot of what you know and who you who you are today has you who you've become today um yeah so thank you for sharing that with us kudos to you for, for voicing who you are not being afraid to go after what you believe in and and sharing it with anyone who will listen yeah and I, and, I, and that takes courage maritza you Absolutely. know uh, i i know there'll be people listening to this who will judge me and 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 that's okay i'm okay to be judged i'm okay um for people to say well you know she's become too australian or she's too modern and she doesn't understand um, but I think deep down when you pull these sorts of things apart, um, I, I, you know, I'm not saying that we have to let it go, but I think we have to evolve. Mm. And, and that's the difference. I don't need to let go of my religion, but I need to evolve. Mm. Um, what was in place two, 3,000, 4,000 years ago maybe not, may not be so relevant today. Um, and we have to be careful that we don't, create boundaries that humans have created using the religion as an excuse um, to get what they want and and therein lies therein lies our battle mm. you obviously grew up uh, quite differently to a lot of probably others that you that grew up alongside you and and had different uh, opportunities obviously because your dad was so open to to an education for you and sending you to Australia to do that Coming here, what was that like for you to, to leave your home country? And at what age did you do it? <laughs> I did grow up slightly differently. You know, my, my father was a type of guy, you know, we had alcohol around the table. We ate meat, you know, we weren't overly religious. And, you know, so we, I, I kind of grew up, you know, entertaining a home with everyone from, you know, ministers to, to corporate people. And so I, I, I was very privileged in that I grew up having conversations with adults um, in senior business positions from, from, from where I can remember when I was very little. And then when dad made the decision to send me to Australia, it was because he felt that I needed the education to have the opportunities that, you know, he wanted me to have. And so I came out of Fiji, having grown up in a very close family, not really being a lot of, around a lot of white people, eating Indian food every day. And, you know, and I arrived in Australia at the age of 16, two long pigtails of this, um, thought you know everyone thought that I would have landed here with the thought of you know education and university and you know degree and and you know all that sort of stuff but all I had in my mind was freedom because I'd grown up in such a culturally oppressive environment so you know you can and Fiji is very different today but when I grew up you know um we weren't allowed to hang out with boys I certainly wasn't allowed any boyfriends you know I wasn't allowed to go to school dances you know sleep sleepovers at girlfriends houses weren't allowed like like, oh, I, and so all of those things that I wanted that I couldn't get home in Fiji, I knew that I'd be able to get in Australia. So went into boarding school and spent the last two years of my school, you know, hanging out with guys, going out and drinking, you know, uh, not studying, doing all the things that I wasn't supposed to do. Um, and and it, going to the culture shock as well, you know, never never really having lived with so many white people before in a boarding school, sharing my room with eight other girls, um, shared bathroom facilities and stuff. You know, these were all things that were so foreign to me. So huge culture shock. Um, and then, of course, my HSC results were abysmal. <laughs> and so <laughs> I wasn't going to go into university. I was going to end up going to TAFE, which was, you know, college in those days. And I remember my dad, like, you know, he was like, I send you there for an education to become a woman, you know, like they were supposed to get this rebellious out of you. And, and then, you know, not only do you, you continue to be a rebel, but you can't even go to university kind of stuff, you know. Anyway, I got into a hotel management course and then 18 months later, um, it, it, sorry, six months into that course, I realised that my Australian student visa was about to run out. And in those days, you had to um, be at university for your visa to be extended. You couldn't do it if you were in college. And so I'd been dating this white guy. And so I asked him to marry me. And the funniest thing about this was, right, so in those, no email, this is the 
you know, early 80s, late 80s, and no email. So I write this letter to mum, my dad and my brother, you know, dear family, I've met this guy and I'm getting married and I love him dearly, bloody, bloody, blah. And I'm staying here forever. Yeah, I'm staying here forever. And, And by the way, he's white, you know. So, of course, there's this massive conniption back home. And my mother says to my dad, you know, this is what happens when you send your children overseas. You know, I'm dispatching you to Melbourne and, you know, you've got to put a stop to this. And so my poor dad arrives here and we go into this negotiation for three days in a hotel in Carlton in Melbourne where, you know, I'd be working during the day and then we'd have dinners at night time and my father would give me and my ex-husband at the time all these reasons why we shouldn't get married and, you know, and then we'd have a whiskey and we'd have a fight and then we'd start again the next day. Anyway, three or four days later, my father gave in and he said, well, you know, if you're going to get married, we have to have the big wedding back home in Fiji. Everybody needs to know that this is something we accept and we, you know, we're, we're supporting you. So we're we backing said, you. Okay. Yep. Yeah, backing you. So he goes back home and this is such a funny story. He goes back home. Mother says, we gave you one job one job and that one job was to stop the wedding and you failed at that and then she says to him you know so what color hair does he have because in her mind he was white with red hair and he he goes well I don't remember what color hair he had (laughs) anyway long story short we had the wedding in Fiji we had 2,000 people at my wedding because I think it was the first time there was the Indian and the Australian getting married but you know that was my dad's way And and you look at why he did that he did that because he wanted the community and his family to know that he accepted my decision, that it was something he backed and he supported. And the way he showed that was by having the wedding that he did. Phenomenal. I thought you were actually going to say this was like a visa scenario. You only asked him to marry you for the visa. And <laughs> oh, well, that actually, was that too. <laughs> but you actually went ahead with it and you did and you, yeah. you got married. It's amazing. Oh, I'm yeah. so I'm so in awe of, of this story so far. And, and I know it's only going to get better as we're talking because <laughs> I, I do want to delve into your career a little bit and what those what those um, movements were like for you um, and whether you endured any bias at all um, being a woman of colour and, and coming into the workforce in such a leadership type role that you were seeking as well. Um, in the first half of my career, so my career is kind of broken up into two parts. In the first half of my career, I, when I reflect on it, it was pretty cruisy. I had great jobs. I worked with a, a, a bunch of people who never saw my colour, but I wasn't in leadership positions. You know, I was in, you know, junior positions as such or mid-level positions. And, and you know, my colour never came into it. I never really pushed for promotions or anything like that. It was kind of like, this is my job. I'm having kids. I'm, you know, I've got a marriage. And it was pretty cruisy, really. And then um, in 2009, I made the decision to leave my marriage. And again, that was something that, you know, culturally is, is frowned upon. And, um, and again, you know, after, you know, my father did crack it with me in that one. You know, he he was very angry with me around that one, but we managed to work our way through that. Um, and, you know, again, he, he, he supported me through that process. And, in fact, there's a piece of advice he gave me, which I'm going to share now, which I have used all of my life. And, you know, he said to me, he said, if you do the right thing by yourself, you'll always do the right thing by others. And it's not about being selfish, but, but it's unless you are happy within yourself, how can you possibly make other people happy around you? You can't. Um, and you you just can't. And um, and it was after that divorce that I kind of made the decision, well, you know, I can't have cruisy career anymore. I've got to be really serious about this. You know, I, I need to support myself. I'm potentially going to be single for the rest of my life. I still have children I need to, you know, support, et cetera. And so I, I started to, I remember taking on a mentor and a coach at that point in time, and they asked me to do an exercise, which is stuck in my mind for a very long time. And the exercise they asked me to do was, imagine if I'm reading the financial review and there's an article about you. Why would I want to read the article, number one? And number two, what would be in the article that is going to be interesting enough for the the financial review to actually write about it? And that was the start of my goal setting process. You know, I I wrote the article and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, we delved into what that 
meant for me from a career perspective. But I started to write my goals and really create my life plan or business plan quite strategically after that. So, you know, I wrote my goals every every year. I put them on my shower wall because I could see them every day. They're still on my shower wall today. I can see them every day. They keep me on track and motivated. Um, I looked at my career as a strategy. So, you know, it was like, well, what do I need to do? I need to have a general manager position. I need to have networks. I need to have mentors. I need to have supporters. I need to, um, in skill sets, knowledge, training, et cetera. The brands that I needed to work in in my industry that were going to be the right brand, they were going to be a woman and a woman of colour. And knowing that as a woman of colour as well, I would have to be the best at what I did. You know, so how would I do that? How would I become the industry expert, the go-to person, regardless of whether I was a woman or woman of colour? And mm. so I spent significant time for myself establishing myself in that pro in that and I think today I have the success that I do and I have the doors open up for me that I do because I am seen as the expert in the industry I am seen as one of the best at what I do I am seen as you know the industry go one of the industry go to people but that takes time and it takes training and investment and courage and not letting anything get in the way um, and and being really committed to being that person Person. And, and having the right people around you and having the right strategy for yourself. Well, you definitely experienced knowledgeable, the right person for the job. And you've proved that obviously many times over, over the last 10 to 12 years in what you've done. I love this goal setting idea. It's obviously become a big part of your life. And um, I mean, what other tools have you implemented in order to achieve your dreams and your ambition? So the business plan is a big one. The other one is, you know, I think it's, it's your voice. And um, it's an interesting one because quite often when you're the only woman or the only woman of colour around a boardroom table with a whole bunch of blokes and I spend my life in these environments, it is hard to have a voice. You, um, you question yourself. The imposter syndrome kicks in. Um, your voice gets drowned out. Uh, your ideas are not listened to. You know, um, people make fun of you. There's, there's joking. There's a whole range of scenarios that we all face in business as women kicks in regardless. And I think the other thing that I've done very well is I've set boundaries for people. You know, people I work with know that I have boundaries. So I will accept a level of behavior to an extent but if it goes beyond that that I'm very vocal in saying well that's not acceptable I don't like that that was a racist comment or that's very biased or you know um, question decisions at, at a corporate level so but I couldn't do that until I'd earned the respect and the you know seen as the industry expert as such so it's that had to come first before I was able to do that. So, so having that courage to actually have a voice, because that's important. There's no point in being the one person or the two people around a table if your voice isn't going to be heard. Very, very true. Now, you've obviously got some huge desires to leave the world in a better place. Um, you've done a lot of work with different organisations over the time. I really want to know more about Fiji Links, um, the not-for-profit organisation that you started, is it, was it 2008? Mm. Yeah. What series of events led you to start that and, and, and how, did it, how did it ignite? Um, so in 2008, I was actually working for another organisation and we were in the field just outside of Latoka in a settlement uh, run by Rotary at the time. I think it's still there actually. And I got asked to see a woman in a home who I found out as I, you know, met her that she was dying of cervical cancer. Um, her husband had died a few years earlier from a heart attack and her and her seven kids were living in this settlement because um, they had no money, um, no income, and, you know, she had no money for pain medication and she was in severe pain and her seven kids were literally watching her, her die. And, and it struck me that, you know, how does a country get to this point and how do we do this to each other as humans? And so I made the decision to look after her. I, I paid for her medication and, you know, sent the kids back to school, gave her food for the family, et cetera. 
And in that journey, I realized that a lot of women in Fiji, particularly in villages in outer islands and, you know, rural parts of Fiji weren't getting their pep smears done because there was a culture issue. They were scared. There was ignorance. Um, you know, if, they, if it was a male doctor, they weren't going to go. Um, and the system wasn't designed like we have in Australia where, you know, everyone is registered. You get a text message to say, you've, you know, it's your two year screening, you know, and we've got a, a massive database, et cetera. And so I then set up Links Fiji and the foundation was designed to go to rural areas of Fiji to do pep smears. And we did a lot of work in Lambasa, Savasavu, did a lot, uh, some work on the mainland, but it was mostly Lambasa, Savasavu and Tavuni. Uh, we did it through um, Rotary. Rotary was a great supporter of ours. And it, it, of all the women we tested, 87% of them had never had a pep smear before. Mm. Uh, we found a lot of women with issues who we then subsequently treated and, and and save their lives. Um, before COVID hit, we were in conversations with a number of organisations in Fiji in terms of how we leverage what we would we have been doing in the islands. Um, you know, we don't want to duplicate the work of other foundation foundations that come out there and the work that they do. We wanted to, you know, you know, fill in a niche that that hadn't been filled before. And, and we were in conversations with um, the Cancer Council and a couple of other organisations and at government level as well. And of course, then COVID hit and everything came to a standstill. Um, my father also had a foundation in Fiji called Lalita Giraj Foundation, which he used to educate um, children. Oh, young, young people uh, and um, more recently he was using it to feed young kids in schools who because of COVID were unable to um, feed feed themselves you know parents weren't mm. working jobs had been lost etc so because everything's been at a standstill for you know 12 months now my intention next year is to combine the two foundations together and I will then you know uh, talk to those in power in Fiji to see what we can do in, in terms of women's health in Fiji still, and then still work with my dad's foundation to keep that foundation going and keep the work that he believed in was so devoted to going as well. So, you know, I, I'm a big believer that um, we have to leave the world a better place than what we found it. You know, the, the legacy I'm a big believer in legacy. You know, we all have an opportunity to leave a legacy. It doesn't have to be massive, but we must all leave the world a better place than we found it. And my father was very, very good at that. You know, he, um, he thought with the heart, he gave with the hand, and then he used his mind to make sure that it, it had the most significant impact that it could possibly have. And I think if we all thought in that way, then we would all leave this world a better place than what we found it. Mm. I think you're definitely following in his footsteps because I know that that woman you met at the beginning of that story uh, actually passed away and she did you went on to adopt her seven children I did she passed away Lemba passed away about three months after I met her and then you know I took on the care of her seven kids through her own um, family and friends in Fiji but I you know Made sure that they had all, as many opportunities as they could, educated them. My youngest one there, Pignoni, is at university now and he's um, his first year university. I've, you know, I've always seen them as part of my family. My kids have always seen them as part of my family. Look, they're all grown up now. They've all got their own lives. They marry, not married. They've got children, partners, etc. But they all know that they have that connection with me. And if they ever needed me, they will, all they have to do is ask. But I did what their mother wanted me to do, which was I kept them together while they were young. And I, you know, made sure that they were looked after. Um, and that was really all I could do. And, I, I, you know, from my perspective, it was like, and you're a mum, I'm a mum. I could think of nothing worse than knowing that you in your last stages of life and you don't know who's going to look after your children. And at the end of the day, um, I hope that I was able to give her some peace that knowing, and she she probably doesn't know that I did what I did, but I was able to give her some, some peace in that. Um, and, you know, they're beautiful kids, all of them. They're beautiful kids. And they've all got lives on their own and um, they've all done so well to have the lives that they have given the life experiences that they did have. And it wasn't easy for them, but they've all grown up to be amazing humans. 
would have been hard not seeing them over the last year. I'm sure. It has been so hard. My youngest one, Pignoni, keeps you know asking, when are you coming over? It's like, oh, honey, the minute I can get on the plane and get over there, I am going to be there in an absolute flash, you know, just to have your arms around me and my arms around you to give you a big hug. I mean, that's just, that's just I can't wait for that. Oh, absolutely. There's, there's so much opportunity to help, like you said earlier, especially in Fiji. Um, and I'm here. So if you need me to do anything, I, I, I'm putting my hand out to, to say, I'm Thank here you. If, you need, if you need anything. Um, I'd, I'd love to be of service in anything that you're doing to help people in Fiji. I'll take you up on that. I'm very good at taking people up on stuff they offer. <laughs> Now, I'd like to really know, I mean, you've shared so much of yourself already and I'm so beyond grateful. What, what now in life are your biggest passions, do you think? You know, I'm 54 now. And so, you know, it's, it's that other horizon in life that you get to, you know, when I was in my thirties, it was very different. And, and now for me, it's, it's, it's a different horizon. So I think I, I, I kind of break my life into three parts and so there's the my own personal goals and desires and I think you know I I, I want to work for another 10 years and I have a range of things that you know I've got my own business that I want to grow uh, I have a property management business that I want to grow and and have you know very successful that's kind of part of my retirement plan um, I want to sit on boards. So, you know, now I'm consciously having those discussions with many businesses, the, the strengths that I bring in business, the experience and expertise I bring, I know um, will be very benefic beneficial on boards. So, you know, I want to sit on boards and then, you know, um, give back to our own industry, the real estate industry in, in the current role that I have, you know, create um, an environment where uh, the industry gets more back, uh, whether it's in data and, and, you know, in incentives and whatever that looks like. But at the moment, we're in this industry, we are beholden to um, other organisations and, and that needs to change. So there's a lot of, you know, that, that, that's a sort of broader stuff around that. And then there's, you know, the, the piece around my foundation, and so, you know, now that dad's no longer here, it's around, okay, how do I, how do I re, you know, reshuffle and rejig this and what does it mean to feed in Fiji and, and what's the best that I can do in, in the time that I want to do it in and, and the best bang for a buck as such. Mm. Um, and then the last part for me is, you know, planning for my retirement. I, I want to retire in my early 60s. And what does that look like? You know, what do I want to do? How much money do I need to have in my superannuation? You know, so making all those wise investment business decisions now that are going to help me in my retirement. And amongst all of that, above all of that sits my family and my friends. You know, I'm, I, I am such, I'm driven by my family. I get my energy from my family. I get my love from my family. I get my purpose from my family. And so for me, it's making sure that, you know, all of my people, my tribe who are important to me, I think more than anything, COVID has taught us the importance of connection, um, the importance of, you know, regardless of whether it's on Zoom or face-to-face -face, is that connection piece is so important. Um, and, and I think with the experience with my father, where he was here one day and gone the next, and we got no warning about it, we didn't know it was going to happen. I think the lesson that I've learned from that is don't wait to see someone because you're too busy. Don't wait to make the phone call because you don't have the time. You know, I think it, we've got to put work second and we've got to put all that busyness second and reach out and make the connection and have the coffee and make the phone call and have the conversation because we literally may not be here tomorrow. That's such good advice. I actually do that a lot now. I've, I've learned that too. Uh, and I, I put time away and I sit there and I'll message everyone who's important in my life and, and make that effort to just connect with them because you, you're right. Things get busy. You get distracted. Work comes into play. Kids come into play. Whatever it is that makes your life busy and you forget about the important things. But you're just so busy going on that mouse wheel um, in your day-to-day -day life and in the rat race that you forget about the important things. So yeah. I think that is such a brilliant message. I do have one last question for you. And I'll, oh, there's one or two. Let's see how we go. <laughs> but uh, what do you think you're most proud of in your life? I'm proud of my kids and, I, and that's not a cliche, that's not a cliche answer. You know, um, I think I look at my children and they are amazing humans. You know, they, you know, 
um, they are independent of thought and of will. And I think that is the biggest gift you can give your children, number one. Look who their um, mama is. Well, look who their mama is. Um, <laughs> they, they too have the same desires that I, they see the world with similar lenses that I do, which is, you know, you must be kind to people and you must give back. And, you know, so, so I'm proud that my kids have got so much of me and my family in them. Um, I'm proud of my own achievements. And I think women find it hard to say that. And mm -hmm. that is another space we need to own. You know, I never went to university. I didn't, I don't have a degree. I've worked bloody hard to get to where I've got to. I've had enormous courage to have the stand that I have. I've had, you know, I've had to dig deep down to have the conversations that I have and the, you know, like even at the beginning of this podcast to make the statements that I have done. I've made them knowing that I'm probably going to upset people, but it needs to be said. And if it needs to be said, then I'm likely to say it. So I'm proud of who I am and all the achievements that I've had, you know, coming out of Fiji um, at a time when the education system in Fiji wasn't as good as it is today. The opportunities weren't there coming out to Australia. And, you know, today I'm the winner of the Telstra Businesswoman's Award. I was named one of 100 women of influence in Australia. I've won a number of leadership awards. I've been a finalist in a number of other organisation awards. I have the job that I have. I have the respect that I do. I have the influence that I have. None of that comes without hard work, sacrifice and um and challenging times and in digging deep into your gut. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably proud of those two things. You know what, it's so easy for us to say, my kids are the thing I'm most proud of. And I'm so glad that you acknowledge that, but also acknowledge yourself because it's important and you should be proud of what you've achieved. You should be proud of that drive and that grit. And, and obviously life has had up and downs for all of us, but it's that bouncing back that, that resilience that you've shown, that, that so many people out there have shown, that's the, that's the shit that we should be proud of. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, your kids are a reflection of you. You are the one as a parent that has the most influence on your children. And so if you are proud of your kids, you have to be proud of yourself as a default anyway. But I think also we have to... Um, we you know you watch these little humans grow up and we have so much influence on in who they turn out to be and at some point they have to turn around and say I am who I am because of the environment my parents put me into without that environment I wouldn't be who I am today and I think as parents we need to make sure that it's not all about protection it's not all about the easiest route it's not about all about giving them everything um, there has to be a balance mm -hmm. That's why it's so scary being a parent too, isn't it? Sometimes you really think you're doing the wrong thing and sometimes as long as we're doing the right thing majority of the time, I think a few it works. mistakes here and yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time today, Sadna. You were open, you were raw, you were real, you, you held nothing back and this is what this podcast is about. It's about sharing our true selves and, you know, allowing other people to hear your story and, and feel some type of, you know, resonation with it and, and linking to their own selves. I mean, we shared a an episode last week my husband got really raw and open and honest about his life and the messages I've had from that have been unbelievable people have have really connected with that story and we were petrified to put it out there because it's 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 vulnerable at its at its core and it's out they're talking about our relationship and you know the testing times and how we've come out of it but if it's helped one two or three people or three thousand people that's why we share these stories. Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you for having me and thank you for allowing me to um, to share my story and hopefully people listening back home or in Australia get a better insight and understanding of, you know, the cultural differences that exist in our worlds. So where are you going to retire, Sadna? Are you coming back to PG? Hell yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm, I'm going nowhere else. I want to do. I want to do, you know, sort of, six months there, six months here, or, you know, six months there, three months traveling, three months back in Australia kind of stuff. But Fiji will always be the place that I return to. It's home for me. You know, whenever that plane lands and my feet touch the ground, I am so grounded. It is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the island girl through and through. And I always say to people in Australia, I'm a proud Fiji Indian girl and you can never take that island out of me. So another six to eight to 10 years till you retire, I'll wait here for you, okay? Yeah, wait there for me, will you? <laughs>
Thank you for listening to the Things You Can't Unhear podcast. I'd love to keep the conversation going. Let us know what you thought of this episode and if something profound came up for you that you want to share, let's talk about it. You can find me on Instagram at Things You Can't Unhear or on my personal page at Maritza underscore Barone. And if someone you know will benefit from something that was said in this show, make sure you share it with them too. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and keep up to date with what's next. And if you can spare a few seconds, please rate and review the show on iTunes just so other people can find us more easily and quickly. And as always, my friends, be happy, be healthy, be conscious and be kind.